you take your Bible, look to the book of Daniel. We'll be in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, anxiety is a normal emotion. When an individual faces uh, potential harmful situations, feelings of anxiousness or anxiety are necessary to survive. When feeling uh, threatened by uh, predators or incoming danger, anxiety actually sets off an alarm to our body. That uh, it alarms us and in that alarm it gives us an adrenaline rush, a hormone, a chemical message to our brain that uh, triggers a, what's called a, a fight or flight response. In other words, this adrenaline comes into us and we are either going to fight what is coming at us and what is scaring us or we're going to flee from it. We're going to run from it. And that's a natural response. Uh, part of that response when that chemical reaction occurs is our heart rate begins to increase. We begin to sweat. Our hands become sweaty. Uh, palms become sweaty. Uh, there's a greater strength uh, and then there is a heightened awareness. Our attention begins to zero in on, on the problem. Uh, this prepares the human for the physical confrontation or the physical flight, whichever uh, is to occur. And, and for today, these feelings of anxiousness, anxiety, normally revolve around maybe a work situation or money or family or health, life. Uh, those types of things that surround us, those issues. This nervous feeling uh, really is in, important to life because it's how we survive. It's one of the ways that, that we survive. Now, over the last couple of decades, uh, anxiety or anxiousness has been on the rise, or at least the documentation of it has been on the rise. According to an article on, in January the 11th, 2020, which was pre-COVID, I can only imagine how bad it is now, but this was pre-COVID. The article from Medical News Today said this, that nowadays duration or severity of an anxious feeling can sometimes be out of proportion to the original trigger or stressor. Now that quote is, on your outline, I wanted you to be able to see that. In other words, I read that whole article, and, and, and in other words, more people are fighting or flighting for things that really don't deserve that level of emotional investment. In other words, people are having these, this sense of anxiety, of anxiousness over things they really shouldn't be that anxious about, they really shouldn't have that amount of anxiety. Uh, it, it is uh, something that is uh, maybe overreacting to, to an issue. We become a very anxious people, a very stressed society. In fact, anxiety issues is now the number one uh, a mental health issue in the United States. That's how uh, much it's become an issue. Uh, today, I want us to learn from the character Daniel in the series I started last week, and the series is entitled Finding Fearless Faith. And so we're looking at really the character Daniel. We're not necessarily studying the book of Daniel verse by verse, but we're looking at the character of Daniel, and we're trying to find some things that will help us have a fearless faith. And so in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to look at how Daniel sought God out, and he he sought God out so as to help those who were confused and anxious. And I think that we'll be able to find some points that will apply to us today. So look to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 2 the entire time, and I'm going to skip around and study different parts of it. But Daniel chapter 2 verse 1 starts off like this. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, that's the king of Babylon, uh, he had dreams that troubled him and sleep deserted him. So the king gave orders to summon the magicians, the mediums, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. When they came and stood before the king, the king said to them, 
I've had a dream and I'm anxious to understand it. So he has this anxiety over the dream, verse four. The Chaldean spoke to the king. Now your translation may have an inserted little paragraph there that says that Arabic begins here. Now let me just give you a quick explanation. We'll get deeper into that later on in the series. But almost all the Old Testament was originally written in the Hebrew language. But there is a small portion that's written in Arabic. And this actually begins the lengthiest section in the Old Testament that's written in Arabic. It's about three or four chapters that Daniel is going to change languages or whoever wrote the book of Daniel is going to change from Hebrew to Arabic. So we'll get into why that happened later on. So uh, back to verse 4. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. The, cling, the king replied to the Chaldeans, My word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb, and, and your houses will be made garbage dump. But if you make the dream and its interpretation known to me, you'll receive gifts, a reward, great honor from me, so make the dream and its interpretation known to me. They answered a second time, may the king tell the dream to your servants and we will make known the interpretation. The king replied, I know certainty, with certainty you're trying to gain some time because you see that my word is final. If you don't tell me the dream, then there's only one decree for you. You have conspired to tell me something false or fraudulent until the situation changes. So tell me the dream and I will know that you can give me its interpretation. Now the first kind of housekeeping order with this passage I need to share with you is that the Hebrews, when they counted years, they would count a portion of a year. So uh, when it said that Daniel and his three friends were in training under King Nebuchadnezzar for three years, the first of that year would have been the very first part of King Nebuchadnezzar's accession year. We would call it like a transition year. Then the second year of their training would be the king's first full year. And then the very last part of their training would have picked up the king's second year. And I, and I say all that to say it was in that second year of King Nebuchadnezzar that he had this terrible nightmare that scares him and brings this anxiety on him and Daniel and Daniel's three friends that we introduced last week, they are now part of the wise men, the counselors to the king. God often communicated in dreams in the Old Testament, New Testament. In fact, in other parts of the world, it's not unusual at all for God to still communicate in visions and dreams. It's unusual for us, but in other parts of the world, that still happens. And so here this pagan uh, King, King Nebuchadnezzar, who is a polytheistic, that means he worships multiple gods, many gods, this polytheistic king gets this dream from the real God and it scares him to death. He goes into what we would call a panic attack because of the dream. Now let me show you four things about helping the confused and the anxious. The first thing I want you to see is that like King Nebuchadnezzar, Many people are confused and anxious. Probably someone within arm's reach of you right now is confused and anxious. Verse 1 states that the king was deeply troubled. It means his spirit, it means was deeply struck. The, the same word is found actually in verse 3, and it's translated anxious or anxiety in verse 3. And the word means to agitate or to impale, to stick someone with a sword, impale, to cut into their heart. It can mean to break. So King Nebuchadnezzar basically is having a breakdown over this dream. He feels his heart has been pierced over this dream. He's quite concerned and worried over the dream. So let's look at some things about confusion. First, Confusion can lead to searching. It often leads to searching. And so in verse 4, he has this dream. So he sends out to the only people he knows to communicate with, his counselors, which most of them are soothsayers. They're, they're witchcraft folks, and that's who he sends out the word to. Even though in verse 8, 
he really doesn't trust what they're going to say. He says, I, I really think you're just trying to worm out of giving an answer because you don't know what to say. And, and, and so he doesn't have a lot of confidence in the answer, but he does search for an answer. Second thing about confusion, confusion can lead to irrational responses. Nebuchadnezzar asked for someone not only to interpret the dream, I tried to emphasize it when I read it, he asked them to tell him the dream. He said, if you really are so spiritual and you talk to these gods that supposedly you know, the God of the moon and the God of the sun and the God of the stars and all that, if you actually know these gods and talk to these gods, then I don't want you just to interpret my dream. First, I want you to tell me more what my dream was. And then if you get that right, I'll let you interpret the dream. And so it's a, an irrational response because he says, if you can't do that, I'm going to kill all of you. And that, that's what he says, all of you. And Daniel and his three friends are in that group of all that's going to be killed. And King Nebuchadnezzar was the type of person that would do it. He had a reputation for it. In 2 Kings chapter 25, it's kind of the history of this period. King Zedekiah is the king of Jerusalem when Jerusalem is conquered by the Babylonians and by Nebuchadnezzar, and they capture King Zedekiah and his sons. And King Nebuchadnezzar has his sons murdered in front of him and then pokes out King Zedekiah's eyes so the last thing he sees is his sons being put to death. That's how brutal this guy was. And so the wise men, these soothsayers, these, these witchcraft folks, these uh, counselors, they knew if the king said he was going to kill them, he would do it. And so not only is King Nebuchadnezzar anxious and nervous, but those others are anxious because they don't know what the dream is. They don't have an answer to the question. Third thing about confusion, confusion expects people to know what humanly cannot be known. Look at verse 11. This is the, um, these soothsayers and, and witchcraft folks and so forth that are answering back in verse 11. They say, what the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make it known to him except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. So they say, only the gods know the answer to this and the gods don't dwell with us, which Daniel's gonna come in in a little bit and Daniel's gonna say, my God actually talks to me and I communicate with him and I can tell you what he tells me and I can share you that information. That's the difference between the true God and these pagan gods. Now, somehow we have allowed things that we should handle with the normal amount of attention. We've allowed them to be dealt with only with this high dose of adrenaline. This repeated demand that we put ourselves in of a fight or flight emotional energy level has led to children and teens struggling much with anxiety and also, also adults. These things are very real to the people that are feeling them. But each person has to begin by accepting what is in his or her control. What is in your control and what is not in your control. We really need to get a grasp of that. So the things that are in my control, I need to work on. And the things that are out of my control, I really can't allow that to have that adrenaline dump in my emotions. It's not good. It's not good for my psyche. So I need to understand I can't control that. Let me give just an example that uh, this congregation will understand a little bit better than the first, uh, first uh, hour understood. Uh, it is not the end of the world to make a bee. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to make all A's, but you have to understand that making a bee does not deserve the adrenaline dump you're putting in your psyche. And that's what adds to your anxiety. Parents, that word is for you too. Your kid doesn't have to always make A's. I made a B once and was proud of it, okay? <laughs> I've, I've interviewed, I think, with probably in church life, they call them search committees. I would guess somewhere pretty close to 20 in my lifetime. 
I've been doing this for 40 years. A lot of people wanted to talk to me when I was good back in the day. And, 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 I, and not a single time in, in an interview, not one time in an interview did anyone ever ask me my GPA. Not one time. Not one time did they ever ask if I made an A, B, C, D, E, or F in Greek. They never asked me. So I, what I'm saying to our young people here, you do the best you can with what you can control, and you ought to try. You ought to work hard. But you need to understand that perfection for humans is very unlikely. In fact, I'll bet you some money you're not going to be perfect. The sooner you and your parents allow that imperfection, the less anxiety and stress you'll have in your life. So don't confuse what is humanly impossible with a reality. And perfection is humanly impossible. Second thing to look at is that Christians can and should communicate in times of confusion. Christians can and should communicate in times of confusion. So look at verse 14, and Daniel comes on the scene now. In verse 14, it says, Then Daniel responded with tact and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to execute the wise men of Babylon. He asked Arioch, the king's officer, Why is the decree from the king so harsh Then Arioch Explain the situation to Daniel. So Daniel went and asked the king to give him some time so that he could give the king the interpretation. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and he told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Asherah about the matter, urging them to ask God of the heavens for mercy concerning this mystery so Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the Babylonian wise men. Now, I want to show you three parts of communication here. First, there's communication with the confused people. So in verses 14 through 16, notice how Daniel communicates with the hatchet man. He was the executioner. He said, why is the king upset? Just give me a little time. Let's see what will happen. Then in verse 16, he communicates with King Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, give me a little time, and I think I can get you an interpretation on your dream. He was polite in his communication, but he, he, he was uh, respectful, but he made the request. The second thing I want you to see about communication is notice the first thing Daniel does after leaving the king, he goes to his three friends. We know them better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He goes to those three friends, and he says, guys, we need to pray. Now, I want you to get this scene here. I want you to understand what we're looking at here. These guys are, at this time, probably 17 years old. These four guys are 17, maybe 18 at the oldest. Daniel comes to him, and he says, guys, we need to beg God for an answer, because if we don't, all the Babylonian wise men are going to be put to death. All these pagan, heathen people are going to be put to death if we don't get an answer from God. This is life and death. And they weren't so interested in their life and death as they were the pagan uh, leaders and the pagan counselors. They were concerned about their life and death. And so get this image. You've got these four 17, 18-year-old boys on their knees, begging God, show us that dream and the interpretation of that dream. That's rich there. We've come a long ways. And maybe anxiety, if we would spend more time with other believers on our knees praying, would help at least work through part of that. A third thing to see on communication here is down in verse 24. Skip all the way down to verse 24. In verse 24, it says, Therefore, Daniel went to um, Arioch, whom the king had assigned to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he came and said to him, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king, and I will give him the interpretation. So the last part of the communication is this. Communicate with the confused the message we receive from God. So, so this is how it tracks. It's really simple. First, you could communicate with confused people, and you try to Okay, encourage them and, and listen to them and try to be there for them. Then you get with some other believers and you talk to God. God, we need your help. And then you go to those confused people again and you say, this is what God said. 
Here's a word from God. That leads me to the third thing to look at about opportunities. Number three, times of confusion and anxiety are a great opportunity to point people to God. Look at verse 27 as we just keep working through the passage. Look at verse 27. So this is Daniel speaking to the king. He's told the king, I've got an interpretation for you. And it says in verse 27, Daniel answered the king, no wise man, medium, magician, or diviner is able to make known to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has let King Nebuchadnezzar know what will happen in the last days. So let me show you how this opportunity to communicate about God occurs. First, Daniel in verse 27 knew that he was not the answer to the people's confusion and their anxiety. Just a word of hope for parents and grandparents. You cannot fix anybody. And the sooner you get to that point, the less stress and anxiety you'll have. You cannot fix anybody. Now, you, you need to love and you need to encourage. You need to put people in the best win positions you can put them in. But you can't fix anybody. So Daniel said, I am not the answer. That's what he said to the king. He said, I am not the answer. The second thing Daniel does is in verse 28, Daniel brought up God and God's power early in the conversation. So instead of going through this long uh, dialogue, the first thing he says, he, he, he says, I, I can't help you, but there is a God in heaven who can answer, answer you. Now, look at that phrase in verse 28 where it says, but there is a God in heaven. Daniel said a lot in that one little phrase, but there is a God in heaven. Although circumstances sometimes may look impossible, there is a God in heaven. Though your marriage, you think it's getting ready to break up, there is a God in heaven. Though you wonder how you're going to deal with the emotion and the stress of school, there is a God in heaven. Where you wonder, what am I going to do with my grown kid that is so wayward? There is a God in heaven. That one little phrase says a lot. There is a God in heaven. Another thing that we see from Daniel from this is that without God... Our circumstances and anxiety are without interpretation. Now, when we read the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, it makes no sense. I'm just going to summarize the vision for you. In this dream, Nebuchadnezzar sees this huge statue, and the statue has a, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, a waist area of bronze, and then the lower legs and the feet are made out of a combination of iron and clay. And it terrifies him in this, he, he, in this dream. He sees this figure, he doesn't know what it means, and it terrifies him. And without God's interpretation, that dream means nothing. Without God's interpretation on your situation, and your confusion, and your anxiety, it, it makes no sense. But once God's perspective comes on the scene, all of a sudden things begin to make sense. Now, let me just show you real quickly. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to solve that vision for you, okay? But I do want to show you three things real quick about that vision. First, we must see our position in relationship to God. So what Daniel says, he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, in this vision, you are the golden head. You are the one that God has put in his sovereignty in this position of great, great authority. He says, man and woman and even animal life bow down to you. God has put you in this sovereign position. And so God is the one who puts the person that he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and how long he wants them to stay there. God's the one who does that. Remember your position in relationship to God. Don't get it confused. My prayers don't tell God what to do. Really, my prayers ought to be me listening to God and letting God tell me what to do. Another thing about this, this dream is some things we can know certain about the interpretation of the dream. There have been volumes written on this. The connection between Daniel chapter 2 and then Daniel 7 and then Daniel 5 and how that ties into Revelation 
and all that. People have written books and books and books, and they can convince you that they understand it completely. Uh, I, I just want to show you the two things that you can hang your hat on. These are the two things you can know for sure from this vision. Number one is that Nebuchadnezzar is the head. He's the goal. Babylon is the, is the goal because that's what it says. The last thing in that vision is that there's going to be a final kingdom that is not going to be like any of the other kingdoms. It's going to destroy all those other kingdoms, and it's going to be the kingdom that lasts forever. So the most popular view in the last 150 years of this, the, this vision and what it means that is presented again with great confidence is that King Nebuchadnezzar was the gold. He was the top of the statue, and, the, and that is true because it says that. And then that the Medes and the Persians, they were the next empire that would take over. And then the Greek empire led by uh, the famous Alexander the Great would come and take over, and then the Roman empire would come and take over. But the only thing that I really know for sure I can take away from this is that only God's kingdom lasts. So with confidence, I want you to know that in the end, and that's what the end of the vision is about, there's this unusual stone that doesn't look like anything else comes in and destroys that statue. And it is the stone that lasts forever. It is the kingdom that lasts forever. When Babylon was in power, King Nebuchadnezzar could not imagine anyone ever taking power away from him. He was the man. But he was destroyed. The Babylonian Empire was destroyed. Alexander the Great thought he was the great. He was destroyed. Roman Empire thought it was the greatest. But it's not much now. The Soviet Union in my lifetime and Charles' lifetime, we remember the Soviet Union, okay? And Todd remembers that us old people here. And Soviet Union is not that big of a deal now. Not to be a prophet of doom, but just to give truth about it. We think in our minds, in our country, that the United States will always be on top of the hill. It won't be. There hasn't been a kingdom to ever stay on top of the hill. There is only one kingdom that is on top and stays on, on top. It's the kingdom of God. You enter the kingdom of God by God's rule, his kingship, coming and taking control of your heart. That leads me to the uh, fourth thing to look at in this passage, and that is our response. God's truth demands a response. So I want you to go to verse 46, and let's see the response of King Nebuchadnezzar. So God's truth demands a response, verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell face down, worshiped Daniel, gave orders to present an offering and an incense to him. The king said to Daniel, your God is indeed the God of gods, Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries since you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many generous gifts. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and, and uh, the chief governor over all the wise men of Babylon. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to manage the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Let me show you three ways you can respond to God's message. First, there's a temporary belief in God, and that's what King Nebuchadnezzar does. He believes in Daniel's God temporarily. I know it's temporarily because next week's message is on chapter three, and he doesn't last very long in worshiping the one true God. Also notice his misdirection in worship. He bows down and he worships Daniel. So he has a confused view of the true God. Second response is he favors Daniel. So there is a favorable treatment towards God's people. So the next thing he does is he lavishes all these nice things on Daniel and on Daniel's friends. And so this is a person who, who likes Christians, wants to support Christians, wants to put up um, political rules and regulations to protect Christians, and all that's great. But that doesn't make you a Christian just because you like Christians. Really, the best response comes from Daniel. It's earlier back in verse 20. And that is our third response, and that is an authentic commitment to God. I won't read the passage. I'll just paraphrase it for you. But after Daniel and his three friends pray and they beg God for an answer, show us this mystery, show us this mystery. And God shows them the dream and the interpretation of the dream. The first thing Daniel does, you can look at it, the very last part of verse 19, it says he praised God. 
And what follows in verses 20 through 23 is a song of praise that Daniel and his friends offer up to God. The first thing he did was not run to the king. The first thing he did was he fell on his knees and he worshiped God. The best response, the only acceptable response to God saying something to me and me recognizing it's from God is to bow down in worship and appreciation of God. Daniel was only 17, 18 years old, but he was mature enough to know that all this happened because of God, and that's where he gave his attention and praise was God. As Jimmy and the praise team make their way to the front, I'm going to spend a little time talking about three questions. I think this is important for us to zero in on these three questions on the screen. First, what are you anxious about? Now listen to me. What are you anxious about? Is it about your health? Is it about your money? Is it about your grades? Is it about whether your parents are going to stay together? Is it about the sickness of aging parents? What are you anxious about? That's the first thing we have to identify in our mind. What are we worried about? What are we anxious about? Second question. Is the result or outcome in your control? Now th think with me, especially young people, think with me. Is the result or the outcome in your control? If you can control it, then control it. There's a high possibility it is not in your control. Most of life is not in our control. So if you can't control it, then I don't need to have an adrenaline dump of anxiety on me. I don't need to do that. That's not healthy for me. And it's out of my control. So anxiousness is not going to help the situation. Third question if it is in your control, what does failure and success look like? So let's say it's that small percent that actually is in your control. If you control it well and succeed, what does success look like? If you don't control it well and you actually fail, what does it look like? What's the worst case scenario? For example, back to our, our example of grades. You should study as much as you possibly can within reason. You shouldn't use God as an escape thing and, oh, God, um, Lord, help me as I walk in today and give me knowledge that I have not prepared for. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't pull that. You study as hard as you can. But then after that, you just got to let it go. If you make an A, you make an A. If you make a C, you make a C. You just got to let it go. The worst thing that could happen is, well, what, what if I fail? You think no one else has ever failed before? It'll be all right. You don't want to know my GPA. You just want to know if I can preach or not. That's all you want to know. You know what they call the doctor at made C's? They call him a doctor. That's what they call him. It'll be all right. What happens if you get laid off from your job? Now we're talking to adults. What happens if you got laid off from your job? What's the, What's the worst case scenario? You get laid off from your job. Well, I mean, I, I'd have to get a job that maybe paid less, okay? What happened if you got a job that paid less? Well, I, I might have to sell my house and get a smaller house, okay? I might have to sell my vehicle and get a, a cheaper vehicle, okay? I might have to go out and eat less as a family, okay? Is there anybody in the United States that lives in a smaller house than you live in right now that is happy? Probably so. Is there anybody in the United States that drives a car that's less of a car than what you drive and are still happy? Probably so. Is there anybody in the United States that goes out to eat less than you go out to eat and is still happy? Probably so. So the worst case scenario is really not that bad, and that's with it in your control. And most of life is not in your control. What was in Daniel's control is I take the burden, I take the crisis, I take the anxiety, I take it to God. That's in my control. That's what's in your control, is going to God. The rest is really up to God. And I'd really rather him handle it than me anyway. I think God's got a longer history of success than I do. And maybe you ought to consider that. 
Let's pray. God, our burdens, our cares, whether they are justified or not, they are real to us at this moment. And so, God, we lift them up to you. Lord, I pray that you would help our unbelief. We do believe, but help our unbelief. And God, for people in this room that they don't know you, they're not in relationship with you, and they really are all alone in all of life's crises and issues. God, I pray that they would see a need for Jesus as their Savior, a need to repent and turn from their sins and embrace Jesus Christ as the ruler of their life so that you can take those burdens and deal with them in a much better way than they ever could. God, I pray in this time of invitation and decision and reflection that we would just surrender and give up to you and you'll do a much better job than we would ever do and we confess that. In Jesus' name, amen.